Good morning and welcome to our online worship for this Sunday, May 16th, 2021. So happy that you folks have chosen to join us, whether this is live or it is streaming at 1030 in the morning or at a time of your later convenience. This is going to be our last pre-recorded worship service that then streams at 10.30 on Sunday morning, as next week we are meeting in person again, right here in the church sanctuary, May 23rd. Looking forward to it in so many ways. I know so many of you are as well. And what we'll be doing, instead of having this pre-recorded service, is if you're not able to make it, if you still don't feel comfortable, or if you're one of those who's begun to worship with us regularly, despite the fact that you are some distance from Stanton, but you've discovered us somehow, well, we're going to be doing a live stream of the worship. And it'll look different, it'll sound different, but it'll be what's actually happening as you, see, so as you see it, that's as it's happening. So you can join in with the responsive parts of worship as we here are doing those responsive parts of worship. And you'll be hearing the same music we hear and all of that. And so I think for those who are continuing to worship online, there'll be a, a, a greater way of feeling connected to what's happening here, even if you're not able to be here. But next Sunday, May 23rd, we are going to be here in person, 1030. Uh, we do ask that you wear masks and we ask that you practice social distancing. But beyond that, we're letting you sit where you want. We're not going to take reservations. Just come as you are. And we really are looking forward to it and to that time of worship. But it's good to be able to worship today as well in this format. I'm grateful for what God's been able to do and how God has used this format uh, in this last year. And so folks, as we come to worship God now, please join me in our call to worship that you see before you. The Lord knows all our hearts. Let us welcome Christ into our lives. The Spirit has testified concerning the holy name of Jesus Christ. Let us receive the testimony of the Spirit. The Father gives us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Let us begin eternal life today, for the one who has the Son of God has eternal life in him. Let us worship God. Friends, our first hymn this morning is called Your Will Be Done by City of Light. Let us worship God now with this hymn. Jesus Christ. 
Friends, far too often we don't call out that God's will should be done. Instead, we call out that our will should be done. We want things our way. I mean, Burger King made it, you know, a whole big slogan about having things your way. It appeals to us. The problem is our way often leads us in paths of sin and away from being the people that God has called us to be. And so as we come to worship God now, it's good to take stock of the ways that we've elevated our will over God's will and our ways over God's ways that we might confess and repent of those things. And so please join me in praying the prayer of confession that you see before you. Righteous God, we confess that we have not remained faithful to your righteous ways. We do not meditate upon your law as we should, nor have we sought to delight in it. Forgive us, God. Block every path that leads to destruction. Steer us into healthy, hopeful ways that we might know your joy completely to the glory of our gracious Lord Jesus. Amen. And now let us silently confess our sins to God. Amen. Please join me in our responsive declaration of forgiveness that you see before you. No matter what anyone says, what God says is greater. Eternal life is ours if we accept the life given to us in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who live in Christ, but an invitation to holy living and complete joy. So know that you are forgiven and be at peace. And friends, now let us affirm we believe with the words the Apostles' Creed that you see before you. Join with me, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, everything that we have is a good gift that was given first to us by God. And it's out of acknowledgement of this that we return back to God a portion of what he's given first to us. And we do that through our tithes and our morning offering. And we thank you, folks, the way you've been mailing these things in, the way you've dropped them off, the way you've continued to faithfully give. It's inspiring. It makes me proud to be your pastor. And uh, I'm so grateful to be able to, to know you. So, so thank you. Uh, now I'll pray our prayer of dedication. And we'll move then from there into our prayers to the people. So let's pray. 
Gracious God, we do thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you for the way that you pour out blessing in our lives. And we ask God that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that we would know you more, see you more, desire more of you. God, we pray that you would bless these gifts that we have given and will give, use them to advance your kingdom in this world. God, you are the God of wisdom and power, majesty and might. And Lord, who are we that, that, that you look with such favor upon us? And yet, God, you have written your law upon our hearts that we can know your righteousness. Your spirit guides us. We have the assurance that you will never forsake us. Christ Jesus reveals all that we know of you. We give you thanks for his redeeming love in spite of our wayward behavior. And we claim the benefits of his sacrifice on our behalf. Help us to be still so that we can hear you speak. Amid the babble of human speech, give us ears to listen to your voice. As demands are made and pressure mounts, put us at ease and sustain us by your presence. As we meditate on the love of Jesus, may the hope he gives be a haven of rest and renewal. Help us to find the discipline to be more faithful. Time passes quickly and our tasks are undone. Translate our desires into commitment. Keep us from putting off decisions that demand energy and effort. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us when the way seems unsure and instill within us that measure of confidence that will enable us to act. Enlighten us with your wisdom. Awaken us to the abiding testimony of your covenant. Illumine the dark places of our nagging doubts. By your power, make us bolder and better disciples. Give us the courage to forsake the easy life and risk personal security so that others may learn of your love. And your majesty, keep us ever conscious of our dependence on you and ready to give you praise. God, we come before you with all the requests that we name now in our hearts. Gracious God, we make these prayers in the name of the one who taught us how to pray, Jesus Christ our Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our anthem this morning is How Great Thou Art by Shane and Shane. Let us worship God now with this song.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Acts, the first chapter, verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 26. And as we come to God's word now, let us come again to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this word. We pray, Lord, that, that our lives would conform to it because we know, Lord, that this, this word has, has the secondary revelation of you in your spirit, God, that it, that it tells of you, that it tells us about you, it tells us how to please you and how to live lives that are good and honorable and just and faithful. And so, God, we pray that, that you would open our hearts and minds to you at this time. God, I ask that if anything I say is not from you, let that fall away. But God, let everything from you be planted in the good soil of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So beginning at verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who is also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, 
and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So did you know that there was a 13th disciple or a 13th apostle, like one that was chosen after, after Judas? It was this man, Matthias, otherwise an entirely forgettable person. In fact, this is the only mention of him in all of Scripture, which, if you think about it, is kind of amusing. Okay, so the disciples, led by Peter, they cast lots, and the lot falls on Matthias, and then there's never a single mention of him ever again in the Bible. And unlike the other disciples, whose paths are well charted, uh, either from Scripture or what we know in church history, nothing else can really definitively be said about Matthias. Some say that he was stoned to death in Jerusalem and then beheaded. Some say instead, actually, that he went to Ethiopia, where he was killed and eaten by cannibals. And some say that he uh, lived to a ripe old age. But we don't really know, and, and no one really seems to care, because this is the only mention of this guy. So, like, if Matthias is that underwhelming of a fellow, I cannot help but wonder why he was even nominated to replace Judas. And for that matter, why bother replacing Judas at all? As we think about that, I want to remind you about what the disciples have been going through. Jesus was crucified, and for a few days they felt totally lost. But then the tomb was empty, and that left them puzzled. And then they meet Jesus, and at first they think that he was a ghost. But in order to prove that he's not a ghost, he eats some fish in front of them, because, you know, ghosts don't eat. He even offers to Thomas, hey, Thomas, go ahead, touch me. But even with all these appearances, Jesus isn't sticking around with them like he did before. Like he'll come and visit and then disappears, leaving them all to wonder like, well, okay, so what do we do next? Immediately prior to what we read today, Jesus ascended into heaven right before their eyes. And he told them that they wouldn't see him again until what we call the second coming, when he comes back for good. And the disciples are just left there, and they're just looking at the clouds right where, where Jesus had ascended and disappeared to, to the point that they stared so long that angels actually appeared and were like, hey guys, uh, he's not coming back right now, so y'all can get on with your lives right now. And so they decide like, all right, we're supposed to, we're supposed to carry on. We're, we're the apostles. We're the ones who are being sent out. And Pentecost hadn't happened yet. The Spirit hadn't been given. And so I think they were just kind of left wondering what to do. And here Peter is. Peter's the leader. So he's like, all right, I guess, uh, well, there were 12 of us before. So with Judas being gone, we need to pick a 13th person to be the new 12th person. And so they cast lots, which is like rolling dice, in order to decide who it would be. And this actually is the last time that casting lots is mentioned in all the Bible. And a little bit later, the Holy Spirit comes, and we never hear anything about Matthias ever again. So why did they pick Matthias? Why bother replacing Judas? I think it was because they needed to move on with their lives. They needed to do something new to help them get over the loss of Judas, who, who yes, had been the one who betrayed them, and yet he had been among them. He had been their friend. Surely at least one of the twelve had been close to him and would have interpreted his betrayal of Jesus, not just as a betrayal of Jesus, but as a personal betrayal, as a betrayal of their friendship. So what I see in this text is a story about moving on with life after a loss. And there are all kinds of losses that people suffer. You know, the death of a spouse, a child, family, friends, beloved pets may die. Friends may move away. We may move away. We might change jobs. There's all kinds of losses we experience. And all these things can be difficult to deal with and difficult to heal from. And, and so I actually wanted to spend some time today talking about dealing with loss and how it is that we can faithfully move on. I think the first thing is to understand that, that no matter what's causing your grief, grief is a process and healing takes time. 
And, and there are no magic cures for grief. In fact, if there were, then really these things would be just a distraction that would shortchange you from finding real healing after a loss. Various people will go through the various stages of grief. You're talking about, you know, like denial and anger and bargaining and guilt and depression and before finally getting to that place of acceptance. And after we've lost someone, life will never truly be the same again. These people were a part of our lives. They, they added something to our lives. And in their absence, life can and still will be good, but it won't be the exact same. And for our own emotional health, we have to come to a place of acceptance about that. And, and there are different ways to do that. Like, like, I know that for my mom, part of how she got to the place of acceptance has been to go through my dad's things and to part with them. And I say that in the continuing sense, because even though it's been 12 and a half years, mom still is going through bits of dad's clothing or his things. And with the clothing, there, there are times that she... She offers some things to me or she gives some things away and she does as much as she can handle in that time for as much strength as she has at that moment before just kind of taking a break and knowing she'll come back to it later. And that's been a part of how, even after all that time, she is still grieved and gotten to that place of acceptance. I think the next thing to do is to realize that, that no person or situation was perfect and, and that includes yourself. When someone's gone, it becomes so easy to allow the waters of regret to well up and to bleed into our current situation. And it also becomes so easy to beat ourselves up thinking about the things that we wish that we had done differently. Or, or maybe the shoe's on the other foot and we cannot let go of the ways that someone has hurt us and now they're not around to make it right or to ask for forgiveness. So whatever the situation, we need to seek God's strength so that we can forgive the other person in the ways that they've hurt us or we're to ask for God for the grace to forgive ourselves for the ways that we've fallen short and the ways that we feel like we've let down our loved ones. Like the night before my dad died, I was watching TV in the living room and he came in and he just stood right behind me. And, and I hate that feeling. You know that feeling when someone's behind you and looking at you? Like, I just, I can't stand it. And like to the point that like in a restaurant, I actually would rather sit with my back against the wall than towards everybody. Like, and so he's standing there and he's just staring at me and he's not saying anything. He's not doing anything. And so finally I just say like, um, can I help you? And, and I didn't say it like in a really a hostile manner, but it was assertive enough to show like, I don't like you just standing behind me looking at me. And it worked. It was enough to make him leave. And those were the last words I ever spoke to my dad. Um, can I help you? It reminds me of that line in Forrest Gump where Bubba's dying. And he says, if I had known that was going to be the last thing I ever said to Bubba, I would have thought of something better to say. Maybe I could have told dad about the ways I appreciated him. Or maybe tried to make peace for some of the unresolved conflicts we'd have, we've had. But, but none of that got done. And so when dad passed away, I found myself having to forgive him for things. But more than that, I also found myself in need of forgiveness for the things that I had done and would never have a chance to make right. And that was necessary so that I could move on to a healthy place. Eventually, eventually oh, people do move on to a healthier place, a place where the pain is less or even at least seems gone altogether. And then a strange thing that can happen sometimes, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but if you've been through it, you'll know it's true. Sometimes we can live with a pain so long that when the pain is finally gone, we actually miss the pain. And we miss the pain for the same reason we miss the person, because it had become a part of us, because it was familiar and we knew it. And that pain had reminded us of how much we loved the person. And so when the pain goes away and when life does return to its new sense of normal, many people experience a sense of guilt to the, because of this, and they may even reject that healing because they feel like, they seem to feel like, like if they can get over it, if they can come to a place of healing, then it means they didn't really love the person who passed away as much. I remember like when my, when my dad died, I was actually upset with myself for how quickly I had gotten to the place of healing. 
And I justified it in all kinds of ways. Like maybe it's because I'm a pastor. Maybe it's because I've had all this grief counseling. Maybe it's because my friends that I talk to have also had this sort of training because a lot of them are pastors. And, and that's why I've, I've been able to move on. But, but I actually worried that I healed too quickly. I got over it too quickly. And it made me wonder, did I not really love my dad that much at all? Had I been a bad son? But eventually I realized that holding on to pain doesn't honor the person that we're missing. Instead, all it does is it eventually will lead to an association in our minds that thinking about that loved one equals pain. And no one would want to be associated with pain or heartache. No lost loved one would want our grief to swell to unhealthy proportions. And so the time must come when we let go of the pain and their passing and move on. Because in addition to it being healthy for us, we know it's what they would want. Of course, none of this means that the missing will ever go away. I mean, there's still moments where I think about dad, especially now that I'm a dad and I'm like, oh, I wish he was around to, to ask about these things or to, to see my kids, like to know them so that they could know him. I mean, that's the case. But I still think the great sign of moving on is there was a time when I would sit around with my mom or my sister and even funny stories about dad would make us, would make us cry. Now, funny stories make us laugh, but sometimes even sad stories do, or things he did that made us angry, or things that were so frustrating, and, and now we just laugh and kind of shake our heads and say, oh, that was him, and I'm glad to have known him. And I think that's what my dad would want. I think that's probably what our Heavenly Father wants too. So the time comes for all of us when, like the disciples in our story, we, we have to move on to let the pain of the past and the present go. We have to go forward with our lives. We have to live, and truly living is how we honor those who have passed. It's how we honor their memory and how we honor our faith in God, the one who has promised us that he has gone to prepare a place for us, that where he is, there, he may, there we may also be. And so the disciples choosing Matthias, maybe, maybe it wasn't one of those things that the Spirit directed, but I wouldn't say it was a mistake. In fact, maybe it was the first important step in their own healing as they awaited the Holy Spirit to come. And so you, when you're faced with moments of grief, take whatever steps towards healing that you can. Even if they don't seem to make sense, even if it's calling Matthias, but take the steps you need, knowing that the Spirit of God is with you in the process. Amen. Our final hymn today is by Shane and Shane. It's uh, Psalm 46. They just set it to music and they're singing it to us. Psalm 46, Lord of hosts, let us worship God with this hymn. Oh, come behold the works of God. At his feet, he breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Almighty oh, one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you.
And so friends, there is time that grief will come for all of us. But when grief does, move forward faithfully. Continue to take steps towards healing, knowing that God is with you. And so friends, go in peace. Serve the Lord in gladness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.